Are we ready to, to go, Lynn? Good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, depending on where you're joining us, it could be morning or it could be evening. Uh, but for us here it's, uh, in Zambia, it's, uh, it's afternoon. So good afternoon to you all. Uh, I wish to welcome you all to this uh, uh, session where the USID um, Expanding Water and Sanitation uh, Project will be sharing some of its experiences with respect to uh, engagement of private sector uh, in, the, in the wash sector. Um, the USID Expanding uh, Water and Sanitation Project is a five-year uh, project which commenced uh, implementation in uh, January 2022 and have been implementing for the past um, uh, one year and, and a half almost. Um, the project uh, is mainly uh, focused on uh, uh, professionalizing service delivery in terms of, of voice service delivery, and also promoting accountability for reliable um, and high quality watch services, uh, but also uh, focused on enhancing the enabling environment for, for private sector. And arising for that, from that, the project has really three uh, objectives. Uh, the first one being uh, installation of um, water service delivery uh, for, with sustainable, financially sustainable and inclusive, inclusive uh, management models. And the second objective is to increase accountability of water service providers, uh, police makers, as well as civic um, uh, leaders. And the third objective is increased private sector uh, participation. So uh, the session has been uh, organized in two, in two sections. In the first uh, section, we will uh, uh, be looking at uh, 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 feedback or observations from the key uh, uh, players in the project, uh, mainly uh, from the project itself and also a perspective from uh, one of the commercial water utilities in Zambia that we've been working with, and then also from the private sector as the first uh, section segment of the, of, the, of the session. The second bit of it will be uh, a session, a question and answer session, where then we should be able to interact and get uh, feedback from, from, from all of us. So without wasting much of your time, I'll call up one, uh, the first presenter, Siwa, to make her presentation, but before proceeding, Siwa, I hope you can uh, briefly introduce yourself uh, so that everyone is, uh, you know, knows you um, and what you are doing uh, before you proceed with this presentation. Over to you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can all hear me clearly. My name is Siwa Mideluabeloa. I work here under the USAID Expanding Wash Project as a private sector engagement lead. So I lead the component that uh, focuses uh, on engaging the private sector in the, the different projects that we're thinking about. So the slide before you really talks about the project's approach uh, towards partnerships. Uh, we have two components um, under, under this project, um, mainly investment and management partnerships. So under the management partnerships, really we're looking at um, getting private uh, sector players to partner with the CEUs in uh, providing uh, operation and maintenance uh, sort of like uh, services as well as service contracts. So this, more has, this has more to do with the service delivery side. On the other hand, we also have investment partnerships. So this has to do uh, with a bit more um, capital investment, looking at um, uh, projects such as design, build, operate, and transfer. And um, this is more on the infrastructure heavy uh, side of things. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the, the slide before you really talks about the approach that we have taken with uh, commercial utilities who are the mandated service providers in Zambia for water and sanitation service provision uh, with regards to how they can identify uh, these potential investments. So the first thing that we did as a project is that we developed a pipeline development toolkit. And this toolkit really is a tool that gives uh, commercial utilities a sort of like a standardized approach to identify, appraise, and structure both wash investments in the peri-urban, rural, and rural growth centers, which is mainly uh, the project's focus. Uh, next slide, please. 
This is the step that we have taken in this pipeline development process. So firstly, we had interactions with the commercial utilities where they were identifying uh, the problems and priorities that they have as, as a commercial utility, and then ultimately looking at the solutions. From there, we came up with a very long list of potential projects, and, and then we, we began to apply a screening criteria to be able to item, itemize those that could then be prioritized because we recognize that we could not that take each and every project during the lifetime of, of the USA expanding wash. After that, we came up with a, with a shorter list after this criteria was applied. So with the criteria, we looked at the financial feasibility of it. Uh, was it speaking to um, social and economic considerations as well? Is it inclusive? Um, is it climate friendly? Uh, those, those aspects. And then finally, we came up with a shorter list and now we're in the, pro we're in the process of developing a roadmap on how these transactions can then be taken to market. Next slide, please. Um, these uh, transactions were then presented at a forum that we call the Private Sector Engagement Forum. Uh, it's the first of its kind in the watch space. And ideally, we, we, we presented these transactions there, but the PSC forums are also meant to serve more than just a presentation of these transactions. They are also a space for clear and direct dialogue, deliberation, and information exchange between the private sector as well as other stakeholders that are relevant in the watch space. It also gives the private sector and the commercial utilities an opportunity to know what opportunities are there in the market, as well as to build trust uh, for potential collaboration and partnerships. Uh, next slide, please. So basically, uh, this uh, the, the diagram that you have before you is just talking about the main cornerstone of this private sector engagement forum. So looking at opportunities, building capacity, as well as uh, um, uh, ensuring that we, we build an enabling environment for water and sanitation service provision. So here we look at an analysis of business risk as well, which is on the both the private sector and commercial utility side, as well as looking at policy and regulatory reform, because we understand that uh, good policy is a benchmark for these partnerships to thrive. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some of the next steps that we as a project are looking at. Uh, we are finalizing uh, the tenders for the upcoming pilot projects that we mentioned earlier with the commercial utilities. So giving them that procurement support to be able to take these transactions to tender. We're also going to be looking at what other support uh, we can consider in the next tranche. So we divided the transactions into uh, two different tranches. So we're looking at some this year and also be considering some in the subsequent year. Um, what is also key is that we'll be looking at advocacy and subsequent deliberation with a public-private dialogue forum on key enabling environment issues. So just to speak briefly, the public-private uh, dialogue forum really is a presidential initiative. Um, it's a forum that brings uh, on board both the private sector and the relevant line ministries to ensure that we promote uh, economic development. So it's co-chaired. There are different technical working groups in that dialogue forum, and they are co-chaired by uh, the permanent secretary of a respective um, uh, ministry, as well as uh, the, the, the chief or the head of an association that that particular uh, ministry speaks to. And so we saw this as a really great opportunity to sort of like advocate for change with regards to tariffs in the watch space, because if they're not attractive to the private sector, we may not be able to um, uh, attract that. So this is a forum that we're using to, to have uh, or to promote uh, advocacy in the watch space. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Sibo. We'll quickly move on to the next uh, presentation. Uh, Warren. Mr. Abenzo, are you there? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Warren Havenzu. I work for Southern Water and Sanitation Company Limited, a, a CU, a commercial utility company that is based in the Southern region of Zambia, where we, where it's actually operating in 22 centers with a, a, a population of about 2.3 million that is servicing and about 65,000 customers that it's actually servicing. Next slide. 
Next slide, please. So just to carry on from where Sibo actually ended, in this project as, as, as a focal point person, uh, I'm, what happened is that uh, during the pipeline development project, we were subjected to actually list the projects that we thought the private sector could actually, actually come in and actually help out. So we, we, we actually narrowed the list to the projects that I'm going to actually present in the first slide. And one of the first uh, projects that we thought the private sector could actually come in is the issue of improved SQL sludge management. And in this, we actually thought it wise that if we private sector could actually design, build and transfer, operate and transfer the SQL sludge treatment plants, because you realize that the whole CU in the 22 centers that I've talked about, we only have one fecal sludge treatment plant, which does not actually suffice for the demand that is actually needed for us to be able to, serve, to service the, the customer base that we have. So in here, we are seeing the tipping fees as some of the uh, ways in which the private sector would be able to realize their investment, and also the issue of uh, sale of treated sludge or manure that is the end use that we realized that if the customers could actually look at that because there's actually high demand for the treated manure. The second area that we looked at is the issue of improving the septage and the pumping, where we realized that the private sector could come in and operate the vacuum tankers. Currently, as a CU, we just have one vacuum tanker that operates in the whole province, where we have the 22 centers which doesn't suffice. There's only one private sector that has a private individual that has actually come on board to also uh, start operating in the same area. And we are seeing this as a business opportunity for the private sector to be able to empty and, the, and, and charge the customers that actually ask for the service with the view that we are trying to actually go by the issue of scheduled emptying. And this could actually create demand for the for, for the service. Next slide. The other area is the issue of boreholes, increased boreholes, the issue of drilling, construction, and running water schemes. By the way, I need to mention to you that the mandate has actually been expanded. Previously, the mandate to run rural areas and growth centers was the was actually done, was actually under the local authorities. Now government has actually given this to the CUs. And as such, there are a lot of skill CEOs that we have in the, pro in the province, about 150, and we are not there. And our target is to be able to actually do a delegated mandate because that is the provision that has been given by the regulator to actually the CEOs to be able to delegate the supervision of those schemes. And also just the running by bringing the third party and the third parties could either be the local authority, the CBOs, and also the private sector. So in this area, we are thinking that uh, when it comes to management of schemes, I think they can take up also those that drill, those that own drilling rigs, they can actually contract, we can actually be contracted to actually do the drilling. Because currently, I think we only have one rig, the whole province that actually operates for all the, for, for, for in, the in the whole province. Next, uh, then the last one that I wanted to talk about is the design for the public toilets where someone could actually construct and the, and operate the public toilets. By the way, I think what is critical here is that instruction that is coming from the presidential directive is that we have running water and the ablution blocks in all public facilities. And this is an opportunity that can be seen by the private sector to be able to invest in public places where they can be charging user fees. So we also saw that as an opportunity for the private sector. Next slide. So just to cement on these things and what CIVO had actually indicated earlier on, we actually participated as a CU in the private sector engagements and the, we were actually given an opportunity as a CU to be able to understand exactly what to explain, what is there for the customers. And also we had some sessions with the private sector where we were actually hearing their views and in these sessions, we realized that it was actually, a, 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 there was a very good representation. There was government, the regulator, 
the, the, the private sector, the see we are the service providers, and we had interactions where we could actually see where we could actually help each other and actually narrow up the gaps for the private sector to be able to find the uh, space for participation in the watch, watch sector. Thank you so much. Thank you, Warren. I will again we'll quickly move into Carmen's presentation. Please over to you, Carmen. Thank you, George. Um, good afternoon. Hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Carmen Brubaker. I'm one of the directors at Access Water, which is a private company in Zambia. And thanks to Sibo and Warren for setting the stage for the case study. Um, I thought I could also provide some context that we have uh, Zambia's Vision 2030 is that Zambia will be a middle income nation by 2030. And part of that is a mandated universal access to safe water. And there's provisions for private sector investment, which is um, what I'll be presenting on today. Next slide, please. Um, Access Water, it's a private company. It operates like a social enterprise in Zambia. We registered in 2014 to provide water and sanitation solutions, mainly in Luapula province of Zambia. We began with manual borehole drilling and uh, solar piped water construction activities, but we soon discovered that construction was not as much of a challenge as ongoing reliable service delivery. So our goal became to build a model that supplies communities with uh, fee paying, but high quality water service and to prove that it can also be a viable business for the private sector. So we piloted our first system in 2015, and then we eventually signed an agreement with the commercial utility, that is Luapula Water and Sanitation, to install and operate rural piped water schemes in the growth centers. So to date, we have 32 piped water schemes and 174 hand pumps under management, serving um, over 120,000 people. Next slide, please. So Access Water provides two options for communities and we engage them through a decision intelligence marketing program. So basically we hear their challenges, offer a solution and then set the correct expect expectation for long-term service. And we believe that this is what has led to success. Uh, the first option we provide is called hand pump insurance or PIN, as you see on the right there. The community receives a monthly maintenance uh, visit, an annual water quality test, and emergency response in case of a breakdown within 48 hours at no extra cost. So the community pays a fixed monthly fee equivalent to about $15 US for that service. And then the second option we offer is um, we provide a modular solar piped water um, service, which is accessed through a prepaid water meter. So similar to a utility. And then each tap is metered at a cost equivalent to about 50 US cents per cubic meter. Next slide, please. So in these pictures, you can see um, a typical metered access point on the right. And on the left, you can see the difference in water quality between what the community was accessing from the shallow wells and what they are able to access through the piped water system. So this piped water system is mostly automated. It includes water treatment and testing, uh, token generation for the prepaid service, service level guarantees as regulated by the National Water Authority. And we also have like staff technicians on motorbikes who are deployed for monitoring and maintenance. Next slide, please. And then in these pictures, uh, you can see a bit more detail into the, um, yeah, into the modular piped water system, um, which we have developed with our partner, Water4. So on the left side, you'll see the inside of the water kiosk and the treatment and control boxes that are there. And then on the right, you can see um, what a typical system looks like. So including the kiosk, the solar panels on top, and then the pump box and borehole, which is then piped um, to the connections that you saw on the previous slide. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, 
I'll make a few comments on the innovations and opportunities from this private sector case study. Uh, number one is that rural communities are able to pay for water and they even take pride in being considered an equal partner in a business transaction rather than just a project beneficiary. Uh, number two is that Access Water has been able to fully cover the cost of operation and maintenance, including some savings toward future capital maintenance costs from <clears throat> the local user fees. And then number three, we're piloting a fully integrated digital monitoring system in 2023 that will allow for several parameters, including a daily water balance and free chlorine residual that we can monitor remotely. So we expect that this will help reduce on our overall monitoring costs and increase our response time to any issues. And then finally, um, through the US Expanding WASH um, project, our small company has had an opportunity to engage with sector decision makers in Zambia. This has been a huge opportunity for us and through the summit and the private and sector engagement forum, our work has had a lot more visibility and we've had a chance of collective learnings. So through this, we've been able to be matched with potential partners and we're really looking forward to what we can accomplish together moving forward. So thank you so much. Um, I'll hand back to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kamen and, and the team for the for the wonderful presentations. Um, just checking if there are any uh, questions because now I'm moving into the second segment of our session, uh, which is discussions and, and questions. Um, but obviously, if people are still thinking, maybe I could just seek some clarification from Kamen uh, in terms of some of the challenges that you you faced in the past and those that you think are probably uh, something could be done uh, right now to ensure that your operations are, are improved. Are there any reforms uh, that you think a government could uh, initiate or embark on? Yeah, thank you, George. Um, we did have a chance to talk with the uh, water regulator on water tariffs. Um, and what we're looking at is uh, being able to engage the community over time because a lot of our costs are in dollars and the quacha tends to move up and down, which is how we're collecting our fees. So we've had a, a few uh, discussions with uh, the authority on that to be able to um, have a process to uh, talk about tariff caps. Uh, on the other side, the way that Zambia's uh, water, or I'm um, sorry, Revenue Act is allocated now is that private sector uh, customers would be required to pay tax on the water, whereas when it's being paid by the commercial utility uh, or the services provided by the commercial utility, they don't. So we've been able to um, talk to uh, the decision makers about that to make sure that it's fair and equitable for um, all of uh, the customers who are accessing these services. Thank you, Carmen, uh, for that for that response. I think we have a few questions um, um, from the forum. Uh, let me go through the first set. Um, was RTI project working with all CUs or a few? A few. Um, so the USAID expanding water and sanitation project is working in four provinces of Zambia, uh, covering three commercial water utilities. Uh, and operating in 12 districts um, in those uh, provinces. Uh, so the project has only been working with three uh, commercial utilities, um, uh, but some of the benefits would definitely be shared uh, with the other CEOs because the, the project is actually working with the means of water development and sanitation. Um, the next question, uh, which probably CEO could help uh, respond to, is do you see a role for water pricing to support creating business cases for private investment in the water uh, infrastructure, in water infrastructure? 
Uh, thanks, Mr. Ndongwe. Definitely, um, I did uh, allude to this in, in the presentation that um, a case for tariffs is very, very important because um, once we have tariffs that are able to uh, cater for the cost of providing the service and a bit of markup, then it becomes attractive to the private sector. So I also mentioned that we have we are using the public private dialogue forum as a space for advocacy in in those matters that sort of um, uh, inhibit or sort of like um, constrain um, making the sector attractive to the private sector. And yes, the price of water is one of those. So uh, yes, yes, it does have a role. Thank you. I think the next one is for Mr. Havenso. Thank you, Pasivo, uh, for that uh, uh, response. Um, I'll move on to the next question and uh, probably um, Warren and Kamen, I don't know who would come first, maybe Warren could go first and then Kamen could also provide some additions. Uh, the question is, how is the price of water and water infrastructure provision set? Um, uh, interested, and, and this is in parentheses, interested either from the access perspective or from the utilities uh, more broadly. So Warren could go first and then uh, uh, coming could could close up the, the, the with a with a response. Okay. Are you then? Yes, yes go ahead. So the, the the price for water in Zambia is basically regulated by the by by, by the regulator who is the, which is NASCO. So when it comes to tariff. Uh, when, when you, it comes to tariff application, you realize that uh, there are factors that you actually look at. The first thing that is uh, the operational cost that uh, you incur as a CU that you need to justify with the regulator when you make an application. So you make an application, then you are allowed to go around to be able to actually have tripartite meetings with the community where you actually engage them. So based on the outcomes of the tripartite meetings that you have with the, 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 the community, then you actually get your application with conditions that are attached because you realize that you cannot just apply for a tariff without meeting certain conditions that are given by the regulator. For example, they'll tell you, you need to make sure that you put this in place. For example, your NRW is supposed to be at this, because you cannot pass the cost to the customer. So when that is done, and when it is actually looked at by the regulator, then it is approved for a period of about three years, which is consecutive. So basically, I think it is actually attached to the cost of investment that you do and how you run your business to be make, make sure that you don't pass the cost to the, to, to, to the, to the consumer. Thank you, Warren. I think you have adequately uh, answered. Maybe instead of uh, coming, going back to the same question, I'll ask her to, to respond to another very interesting question. Um, here goes, come in. Uh, how has the community managed to afford these services, especially that Luapla province where you operate is among the poorest in the country? Come in, are you there? Thanks. Yeah, sorry, playing with my mute button, apologies. Um, <laughs> part of it is we're able to operate uh, quite efficiently. Uh, we have a very low overhead and uh, we we check that um, as Warren was saying, our non-revenue water, it's low. Uh, we have technicians on motorbikes who are able to monitor several systems. But what we're finding is that if you provide a valuable service, uh, even people in low economic areas will be able to prioritize paying for that water. And sometimes maybe they're only paying, um, you know, for eight cubic meters for their tap for the month, but they're still able to use it for drinking, cooking. And we see that the, the, um, co the con consumption is going up over time. So we believe it's valuable. And I think that's the, the business plan to ensure that uh, we, we continue to make it affordable and um, valuable for the end user. 
Thank you so much, uh, Kamein. In the interest of time, I, I think we'll, we'll end here. I just want to thank everyone who uh, participated, who was who joined us to listen in. Um, and obviously, we're open to sharing more ideas and any other um, questions that people might have uh, off uh, offline. And we could be able to, to give you some uh, feedback and, of course, uh, learn from the various experiences that we might have across from the various people who joined us. So thank you so much um, for joining us. Um, and please enjoy the rest of the sessions today and uh, the rest of the World Water Week. Thank you and bye.